Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second uh, NRES seminar of the semester. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Nathan Nelson from the Department of Agro Agronomy uh, here today. Just a little bit about Dr. Nelson. Uh, he's a Manhattan native uh, and uh, is, in a unique, is in a unique position to talk about the NRES program because he is both an alumnus of the NRES secondary major as well as a board member for the governing group of the secondary major. Um, so Dr. Nelson has a bachelor's degree from Kansas State, uh, and he moved on to North Carolina State University where he earned his master's degree and PhD in soil science, if I remember correctly. So Dr. N Nelson's area of research uh, he focuses in on looking at chemical, biological, and management factors that influence the availability and loss of nutrients uh, from agricultural ecosystems. Something really important if we want to eat, like Dr. Stack talked about last week, as well as enjoy clean water. Okay. So looking very much uh, forward to Dr. Nelson's presentation here today, Dr. Nathan Nelson. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, <clears throat> so the presentation today will be uh, mainly covering uh, some research results, some recent research results that we have on uh, a study here close to town looking at the effects of cover crops on water quality. Uh, and before I get started, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the other people that have helped make this project a success. Uh, a graduate student, David Abel, um, faculty, uh, Craig Rosenbaum, who's here in the, in the room, Gerard Klutenberg, Peter Tomlinson, and then Jeff Williams, also here in the room, and Phil Barnes, so other faculty here at campus. It's a fun project to be involved with multiple faculty on, on the project. And before I even get into talking about the, or answering this question, can cover crops reduce phosphorus loss from surface applied fertilizers, I'm going to talk about phosphorus itself and about some of the different pathways of phosphorus, how, why, why we use phosphorus, and how it can be lost from systems, right? So <clears throat> apparently I wasn't, I wasn't here for last week's session, but apparently they talked about food production, right? Feeding the world. Feeding the world. So in order to grow that food, we have to have nutrients, right? And phosphorus is an essential nutrient for crop growth. Uh, without any phosphorus, you see here, uh, pretty poor crop growth you can have some pretty decent crop responses from phosphorus, particularly when, when we deplete our soils. And so it's pretty important to have that fertilizer. If you look at world uh, phosphorus uh, supply and demand, about 85% of the phosphorus produced in the world is used in fertilizers, right? It's essential that we use that fertilizer, or that we use that phosphorus to produce foods, which is one of the reasons why we have such uh, a large fraction of the fertilizer, or of the phosphorus production that is used in fertilizers. This bottom slide here uh, gives a little picture. This is looking at fertilizers in general. But if we were to maintain our crop yields from back in 1960s, which is prior to uh, the, the broad scale use of fertilizers, uh, if we were to maintain yields at that rate, we would have to double, uh, even close to triple the land area in production to meet global food demand, right? And so because we use fertilizers, we can grow a lot more food on less land and have less environmental impact from that standpoint. So fertilizers are an essential part to uh, crop production, uh, feeding the world, and even uh, <coughs> land, con land conservation or land preservation, right? However, uh, if that phosphorus is lost from our agricultural lands, it can degrade water quality. Here we have a few photos uh, this is a uh, blue-green uh, blue algal bloom in uh, Centralia Lake, just nor in northeast Kansas. Uh, here's another algal bloom in uh, Cheney Lake. Cheney Lake provides about 70% of the water for the city of Wichita. Pretty important water supply. And when we get algal blooms, we have uh, problems, potential toxins that can be produced. Basically, when you put fertilizer on land, we get better crop growth. When you put fertilizer in water, we get better algae growth. They respond similarly. Phosphorus is a limiting nutrient, so they're going to respond when you put phosphorus into the water. 
You might have heard this is a, a, a few summers ago where there was an algal bloom in Lake Erie that shut down the water supply for the city of Toledo, left 400,000 people without water for about three days. Right? So if, if, we, if these algal blooms get out of control, they can have pretty substantial impacts uh, to the people that rely upon the water resources uh, for their drinking water supply. Not just drinking water supplies, but also recreation uh, and economic incomes can be impacted by water quality degradation. This is a few years ago, um, a newspaper article in, uh, uh, from Abilene talking about how Milford Lake was closed due to a harmful blue-green algal bloom there. Uh, they estimate between 40 and 50,000 people generally visit Milford Lake on Labor Day weekend, but that Labor Day weekend it was closed, right? That's obviously going to have an impact on the local economy. And particularly over time, so this was back in 2011, there was a, a pretty big uh, increase in harmful algal blooms here in Kansas between 2010 to 2011, but since then we've, we've tended to have uh, continue to have a fair number of, uh, of blue-green algal blooms, or harmful algal blooms, I should say, and uh, they are starting to impact uh, visitation to some of our major lakes, starting to impact uh, land values around some of these reservoirs uh, because people aren't, there's smells and odors and loss of recreational value. So <clears throat> they're having some impact here in Kansas as well. So we want, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty big need to reduce the phosphorus losses so we can try and control these harmful algal blooms. And uh, there are, however, there are many factors that influence phosphorus loss from agriculture. I'm going to hit on a few of these right now. Uh, fertilizer placement, whether we place that fertilizer below the surface or on the surface, impacts uh, whether or not it's going to be lost. Our tillage systems impact erosion. Uh, phosphorus is strongly absorbed to soils, and so a lot of phosphorus can be lost with soil erosion. Okay, so if we can stop erosion, we can minimize phosphorus loss, uh, uh, or we, we can do a pretty good job of minimizing phosphorus loss. The timing of our fertilizer applications also impact, uh, uh, can also impact losses, as well as climate, right? So wet spells, dry spells, things like that. Some things out of our control, some things that we can control. I'm going to hit on these in a, in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. So this is some data from a national database <clears throat> showing total phosphorus loss by different types of tillage or management. And you can see that uh, phosphorus loss from conventional till uh, agriculture tends to be considerably higher than no-till. This is total phosphorus loss. This is mainly because when we convert to no-till, we reduce sediment loss, right? So one of, the, one of the first things we're going to try and do to control phosphorus loss is reduce sediment loss. At the same time, and, and our, one of our primary ways of doing that is with no-till. Some of our research here in Kansas shows that as we convert to no-till, we do do a good job of reducing sediment loss, but we also increase the runoff, just the water that comes off. This is because no-till will leave a uh, pretty heavy residue on the surface, uh, of, a, of soil, and then that shades the soil, reduces evaporation, and so you, the soil stays wetter. And when you have rainfall on moist soil, you have more runoff, right? Uh, so here we see two different locations, uh, the runoff from no-till versus uh, a chisel-till system, and we tend to have a little bit more runoff from that no-till system. When we have more runoff, we can transport more dissolved nutrients. Okay, so nutrients that aren't attached to sediment. And we do get some phosphorus that, that, that uh, leaves uh, in a dissolved form. It's very bioavailable, so it's pretty important to control the dissolved phosphorus. And we see here uh, dissolved phosphorus losses by different tillage systems. And you see that in no-till, uh, this is that same national database, in no-till we, we, we appear to have considerably more dissolved phosphorus losses than we do in conventional till systems. Right. There are a number of factors that go into this, but, uh, but that's, that's the general trend. And so <clears throat> we're looking for management practices that can reduce these dissolved phosphorus losses as well. That's kind of our next, our next place to go for reducing phosphorus loss. Now let me look at, let's look at our fertilizer placement. We can place fertilizer on the surface, use large equipment that 
can travel pretty quickly um, and uh, pretty efficiently cover a lot of acres. Uh, so there are some advantages to surface broadcasting fertilizer. A piece of equipment like this can move very fast. It's got a, a large boom, can cover a lot of acres uh, in a short amount of time. It's convenient, uh, and then it's also cheaper, right? It's nice to do it in the fall because that's when we have uh, a lot of time in agriculture. You can subsurface place uh, fertilizer. A lot of times this is done at planting. Uh, it's slower. Uh, it can require different fertilizers that can be more expensive. Liquid fertilizers tend to be more expensive than the dry fertilizers. Uh, it can interfere with planting operations. We don't have quite as much time, so it's a little bit more, it can be more difficult to manage. But the advantage here is it's less susceptible to loss, right? And we have a fair amount of data that show this. And when, when applied at the same time, you're always going to do a better job uh, of controlling phosphorus losses if you uh, subsurface apply it. So here we see bioavailable phosphorus losses from three different placement methods. These are no fertilizer, subsurface placement, or broadcast. And we see higher bioavailable phosphorus from broadcast, as well as higher, higher total phosphorus losses from the broadcast fertilizer. So <clears throat> from an environmental standpoint, we'd, we would recommend subsurface placement. However, from an economic standpoint, from a time management standpoint, there are reasons why a producer might want to surface broadcast. <clears throat> Which brings up, uh, oh, one more thing. So let's look at timing. Uh, if we look at average precipitation throughout the year, um, starting in October and then I'm going back to the next fall. This is here in Manhattan. We see that our low precipitation occurs December, January, February, right? It's also when we're going to have our least amount of runoff, right? January and February so far, I think even December. If we look at December, January, and we're almost through February this, this year, we've had no runoff uh, from our experiment, right? If you don't have any runoff, you don't lose any phosphorus. Uh, we have had some rainfall, it just hasn't been enough, right? So the idea is if we apply our fertilizer uh, in these months or at this time, we might have less risk of loss. The rainfall that comes can dissolve that fertilizer, move it into the soil, allow it to react with the soil, and then, uh, and then by the time we get our heavy spring rains, uh, we'll have less loss. And so maybe if we time our fertilizer right, might reduce some of those losses. So the question is, if this is the, right, if this is the place we're going to choose, we're, if we're going to choose that kind of placement, and we're going to try and minimize our erosion with no-till, right? in that system, uh, are there other best management practices that we can use? Right? Potentially, cover crops are a best management practice that could reduce runoff in these systems could actually reduce some of the phosphorus loss, some of the dissolved phosphorus losses uh, that, would, that we would expect off of our no-till systems. And so that's the, the objective of this study. There hasn't been any other research that, is, that has intensively looked at this combination of systems. Uh, but there's a lot of interest in using cover crops, and it is potentially uh, a best management practice to reduce phosphorus losses. So our questions are, how does phosphorus loss from fall surface applied fertilizer compared to spring injected? Right? Uh, so that would show us uh, some effect of placement and, and climate, right? So if we just change our placement and timing, how does that impact our phosphorus loss? Will cover crops reduce phosphorus losses? And then finally, are the cover crops going to reduce phosphorus losses specifically from that fall broadcast fertilizer? That it might be a unique, a unique best management practice there. So now I'm going to move into our, our research study and, and then talk to you a little bit about the results. Uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to, to stop me and, and raise your hands. There will be time for questions at the end as well. So let me talk a little bit about the site. So in order to do research on runoff like this, natural rainfall runoff, you need large plots. Uh, so you can collect enough runoff that you can collect it and measure it and sample it. And so we've set up some plots out uh, south of Manhattan here. Uh, this is a, a hill slope, so sloping down uh, the figure uh, with terraces running across on these lines. So this field had been terraced previously. And what we did is we divided it up into 18 small watersheds. 
right? Each small watershed is about 1.2 acres in size, right? But they all drain to a common point uh, indicated by the red uh, triangles on this figure. And so once we've divided that up, uh, I'm going to show you a, a photo of this, of this site standing down here looking up. Uh, here's what the site looks like. You can see the terraces that run across the site, right? Uh, the triangles would be these points here where all of the water, uh, it runs down this slope, hits the terrace channel, and then runs out, right? And then we have equipment to collect that water and measure it uh, at the outlets of each one of these watersheds. I'm going to show you another photograph now standing up here at the top looking down that row of, of watersheds. So up here again you can see about the slope of the site. Uh, here's where we collect all of the runoff. It runs through this flume. It's an engineered device that we use to measure the amount of runoff coming off of a plot. Uh, so the depth of water in that flume can be related back to the flow. We have one of those at the outlet of each one of these watersheds. And we have shelters that contain sampling equipment. I'll show you some photographs of what that sampling equipment looks like. But we have to have automated equipment out there to measure the depth of water in these flumes at every, time, at every point in time, and then also take samples whenever water runs off these plots. Uh, here's another photograph of a little closer up of the site. Uh, we've mounted these flumes on, on concrete and then have a little collection device down, downstream of the flume. So as water flows out of the flume, it fills up this little um, pipe there, and, uh, and then that's where we collect our samples from. In large rainfall events, this would uh, do much more than fill up that pipe. It, you, know, uh, you can get uh, quite a bit of water that flows out of these in big rainfall events. So let's look at our methods. It's a, this is what we refer to as a small watershed or a field scale study. Right? Uh, where we've tried to put together uh, large enough plots where all of the variability, the natural variability that you would find in a field are present in these plots. All of the, the runoff mechanisms, the hydrology of these plots would be very similar to a field. <clears throat> the study is a no-till corn soybean rotation. It has, uh, it'll go on for five years. We've just finished our first year, starting our, our second year of the study now. Um, it will be a no-till uh, during the study. However, this first year uh, we grew corn out there and it's really conventional till corn. The reason is is because this field had been in conventional tillage up until we planted the, you know, the first year of the study. And so we really have to interpret these results as what we would expect of a conventional till system rather than a no-till system. We have a factorial treatment structure. Uh, it's a three by two factorial uh, we have three different phosphorus management systems, 0, 82 uh, kilograms of, of phosphorus uh, applied in a 2x2 two two placement at planting, so this is subsurface application, and then 82 pounds, that should be kilograms per hectare, sorry, uh, <laughs> P205 uh, broadcast in the fall. Uh, and then, so that's one, one factor, three levels of one factor, then the other factor is with or without a cover crop. So a two by three factorial comes up with six treatments, right? And we have 18 watersheds, so we can replicate those three times. That's our experimental design. Here's a, a plot layout. Uh, you'd see uh, we've got cover crop plots in green, randomized throughout the site, and then our fertilizer uh, indicated by the speckles or the, the stripes or the, uh, or the clear plots. So that's the, the treatment structure. At e uh, so at each plot, we'll have a automated water sampler uh, sitting out there. This measures the depth of water in the flume, right, at every, I think, once a minute. It collects measurements and, and determines the depth of water in the flume. And uh, then when there is water running through the flume, you would have um, a sampler. It, this, would, this would measure the amount of water. And then every time you get one millimeter of runoff, which comes out to be somewhere around on these plots, these size, it comes out to be somewhere around 170 or 180 cubic feet of water. Every time it's 170 to 180 cubic feet of water, runs through this flume, it collects a sample. 
puts it in a, in a container. They're flow-weighted composite samples. That's what that's referred to as. And then those samples are brought back to the lab and analyzed. Uh, we analyze them for sediment, dissolved phosphorus, total phosphorus, dissolved nitrogen species, and then some total nitrogen as well. <clears throat> I'll just be talking about the sediment and phosphorus loss and the runoff as well. Uh, we also con collect a, a bunch of agronomic measurements from the site. Uh, we're looking at nutrient content of the biomass and the grain for both the crop and the cover crop. Uh, we will determine some agronomic and nutrient-related uh, parameters such as nutrient use efficiency and envir environmental nutrient use efficiency, economic profitability. Uh, so those are other things we'll be collecting. I'm not going to be talking about any of those today. Um, I'll be focusing on, on the water quality stuff today. <clears throat> so to give you an idea of the data that we have and, and what it takes to, to measure this and collect this data, so the first year of the study, it's kind of difficult to get some of this stuff set up, right? We need to have our instrumentation running in the middle of rainstorms. Had some pretty big rainstorms, and sometimes that causes instrument failure, right? So we had a little bit of that. We had 12 runoff events uh, that occurred last summer, uh, starting in May, going through September. Uh, with 18 plots and 12 runoff events, that would give us 216 possible measurements for each parameter of interest, right, for runoff, phosphorus concentration, total phosphorus concentration, total phosphorus load, et cetera. Um, of that, uh, we have 197 runoff values, so about 9%, almost 10% of our runoff measurements were missing due to some equipment malfunctions that, that occurred out in the field. Um, when we get to our concentration data, we have a, a slightly higher missing data values, about 30 to 40 percent missing data. This is primarily due to the fact that we had a lot of erosion. It was conventional till, and that sediment interferes a lot with data collection, particularly sample collection. Um, if, you're, if your sampling line gets covered with sediment, then, it's, an un, then it's, a, it's a biased estimate of sediment loss, and so we have to throw that data out. And so we threw out, we, we collected all those numbers, analyzed them, but then we threw them out if, if we had problems in the field. Because of this, we only have five events that have a full data set. Uh, so I'm going to show you some results that show all 12 events, and then I'll show you some other results that are just five events. Um, also, the data required uh, transformation uh, in order to get normally distributed residuals. So those of you who are familiar with statistics, uh, you have to have normally distributed errors uh, in order to meet the assumptions of standard statistical analysis. And these data all had to be transformed to, to meet that assumption, and then I back transformed the data that I'll be presenting today. So let's look at what, uh, what the year looked like as far as our operations and, run and rainfall. Uh, we planted our cover crop back in November broadcast our fertilizer uh, somewhere beginning of January. Then uh, our cover crop uh, was terminated and we planted corn middle of April. Okay? There was not any runoff until the beginning of May. Right? There was about four inches of rainfall between the time we applied our fertilizer and the time we collected our first runoff. So we had a lot of rain, it just didn't produce any runoff. It was pretty dry, that's the reason. Um, we had uh, about average precipitation in January uh, and February, but then March and April were, were both below average, and so we had uh, low rainfall and dry soils going into the spring. Right? However, once we hit May, we quickly caught up to our average. May was much wetter than normal. Had a lot of rainfall in May, and then it, it actually continued to be about normal the rest of the year. So here's our uh, runoff data and our precipitation data for each of the rainfall events that produce runoff, okay? Um, precipitation over here on the uh, left axis and runoff on the, on the, or, sorry, actually they're both the same. Runoff or precipitation can be read off of either axis. Um, this shows uh, the effect of cover crop, the main effect of cover crop on runoff for all 12 events. 
In general, we had, uh, overall, we had a 16% reduction, so about a one inch savings in runoff. We had about five inches of runoff from the plots with cover crop and six inches with the plots that didn't have cover crop. So the cover crops effectively reduced runoff, and that's what we were hoping they would do. They dried out the soil a little bit more in the spring, and they actually, but that effect persisted throughout the season. I, I didn't ex expect it to persist quite that much throughout the season, but uh, we expected that, that was due to um, better soil aggregation, better soil properties uh, in those plots that had the cover crop compared to the plots that did not. Um, so that was, that was uh, a positive benefit of the cover crops. If we look at their effect on sediment, they reduced sediment by about 50% as well. Like I said, this was a conventional till system this first year and uh, tend to have a fair amount of sediment loss in those systems. Uh, but it reduced it by over 50% when we use the cover crop. It's really effective at reducing sediment loss. And uh, particularly in, in some of these uh, large events at the beginning of the year, as you get to the end of the year, if you remember on the previous slide, uh, this rainfall event uh, in September was the largest of the year. And it had a lot of runoff. Some of, the, some of the highest runoff of the year occurred in September. However, the erosion was pretty low because we had a crop growing out there and everything. And, and the effect of cover crop tended to, to decline over time. If we look at the, uh, the cover crop also reduced total phosphorus loss, very similar to sediment loss. This is what we'd expect. I told you before that uh, a lot of the phosphorus had absorbed the sediment. So um, if you reduce sediment loss, you do a very good job at reducing phosphorus loss. Uh, here, uh, when you got out to the very end of the year, uh, this was actually, there was a significant effect of time here where by the end of the year we had a different effect of cover crop than we had in the beginning of the year, showing that that effect was more, more substantial for the first runoff events. Then if we look at dissolved phosphorus loss, there uh, we really had an impact, the cover crop had a really big impact in the beginning of the year. Um, Really, really dropped uh, dissolved phosphorus loss for that first runoff event. And uh, I really can't read too much into this because there was an interaction, cover crop and fertilizer management. And so when I get to, the, when I get to that slide, I'll, I'll talk about this more. But this is just the main effect here. Note here that our, our losses, uh, our dissolved phosphorus losses here are about a tenth of a kilogram per hectare or three tenths of a kilogram per hectare. That's about 10% of the total phosphorus loss from the previous slide. We had about three kilograms of total phosphorus loss. About 10% of that was dissolved um, without the cover crop. So dissolved phosphorus losses are, are, are the minority here. Our fertilizer placement did not affect total phosphorus losses okay, um, throughout, throughout the year. However, what it did do is there was a substantial impact of fertilizer placement on dissolved phosphorus. So when we put that fertilizer on the surface, even though it was placed on the surface back in January, we had a lot of rainfall that didn't cause runoff. By the time we did get runoff, there was still high enough phosphorus in the surface soil that we had much higher dissolved phosphorus losses uh, from that fertilizer. And that persisted throughout the entire season. Even on this, the, the last rain off, uh, rainfall event of the season, we still had higher runoff or higher dissolved phosphorus concentrations when we broadcast the fertilizer. This was another thing that I kind of didn't expect. I expected that effect of fertilizer placement to, to stop sooner. And other studies have, have shown that, that the effect of fertilizer placement doesn't, uh, doesn't last uh, or decreases over time. We definitely had a decrease <coughs> over time, but it still persisted. Um, anyhow, so this is, uh, and we see, here's concentration, concentration data. We see that the, the concentration of dissolved phosphorus, again, remained high throughout the, throughout the season. So <clears throat> uh, higher concentrations produced higher losses. Now, so the big question is, and if we pair up, we look at, you know, how did, how did cover crop affect these losses within the treatments, right, within the different fertilizer treatments? So that's the, the, the uh, main objective of this study, was to see what cover crop would do uh, within each one of these systems. So where we didn't apply any phosphorus or where we injected the phosphorus, 
uh, the cover crop had no effect on dissolved phosphorus losses, right? However, when we, fall, when we had that fall broadcast treatment, the cover crop reduced our dissolved phosphorus by about 60%, which is what we were hoping it would do. <coughs> Note that the cover crop reduced runoff by about 16%, but it reduced our loss, our total loss, by 60%. So it's reducing more than just uh, the volume, but there's some impact of the cover crop on the concentration. Here, uh, the statistics are not quite um, significant. They're pretty close uh, to show an interaction uh, where you had lower phosphorus concentration when we had a cover crop. There's a lot of variability in the data, but uh, there's a tendency for lower concentration. What we would expect what we expect might be happening is that uh, when the cover crop reduces runoff, um, what it would really be doing is, is delaying the time until you have the start of runoff, right? So you're increasing some infiltration early on in the, in the rainfall event, and that might be causing some of the phosphorus that is dissolved to move into the soil, maybe have some better soil contact early on. Generally, we see our highest dissolved, any, any dissolved constituent, our highest constituent losses at the very beginning of a runoff event. So if we delay the start of that runoff event, we can reduce concentrations. So that might be what's happening here. Um, that's something we'll be looking at in the future, is to see if that's, if that's how, if that's why this is occurring. So our, our conclusion here, this is to try and answer my initial question, right? Uh, can cover crops reduce runoff or reduce phosphorus loss from fall broadcast fertilizers? First, we, we did find that they reduced runoff, sediment, and total P losses. Um, in conventional till corn, uh, our broadcast P did increase dissolved P losses, and that lasted throughout the year. But the combination of cover crop and uh, surface broadcast fertilizer resulted in 60% less dissolved phosphorus losses. So we're expecting that uh, the cover crops can be a, a good best management practice, particularly when producers are broadcasting fertilizers. But we need more, more data. This is one year. Uh, this was more in a conventional till system. Our future years will be looking at uh, a no-till system and different climate patterns, right? So uh, I guess with that, uh, I guess I'll acknowledge some of the people that have helped this. Uh, help this project come together. Our funding, we're funded, uh, the vast majority of funding, actually all of the, all of the funding to, to do the research out there, the university and the state uh, put together money to set up the site, but as far as the research to, uh, to, to do this study, it's all private funding from the fertilizer industry. They're very interested in developing best management practices uh, to reduce these losses. They have uh, um, interest in, in understanding uh, the, the effects of, of fertilizer application on, on environmental quality. And then so a lot of it comes from the fertilizer industry uh, and then also from the Kansas Soybean Commission and the Kansas Corn Commission here locally in the state. With that, are there any questions? Yeah. Did you guys uh, made, uh, measure uh, like cover crop uh, dry matter growth? We did. Yeah, and I can't remember the exact numbers. It wasn't really large last year. So we had, I'm thinking it was maybe like 250 kilograms per hectare. So it's about 250 pounds per acre, right? 250 to 300, I think is what it was. But what, that's not very much. Um, we planted late and then, you know, planted corn in mid-April and just didn't have a lot, of, a lot of growth. But still with that, with pretty low growth, we still had decent impact. Yeah? You indicated you got a cover crop before, phosphorus on before that cover crop, correct? Uh, we put it on after we planted the cover crop. Are you monitoring how much phosphorus is going up into the cover crop? Yeah, so when we terminate the cover crop in the spring, we collect or prior to, prior to killing the cover crop, we'll collect uh, biomass, 
and then measure the amount of phosphorus that was actually taken up by that, right? And so as I said, the, we didn't have a lot of growth. We did measure the amount of phosphorus in that, and the amount of phosphorus that was taken up by the cover crop was pretty negligible compared to the amount of phosphorus that was applied uh, in fertilizer. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So we had a mixture of three different varieties uh, going into this year, uh, winter wheat, rapeseed, and hairy vetch. So a small grain, a brassica, and a, and a legume. M the majority of the biomass was, was winter wheat. Uh, again, because we, it's this is the first year of the study, and, and we planted in the beginning of November, right? We would have had better growth in, of, of those other species if we hadn't been able to plant earlier. Um, this year we just, uh, following corn and going before soybean, we just planted a small grain, which is winter wheat. Uh, and then after corn, we'll go back to a, a mix. Or then, the, you know, in future years, when after, or after we plant soybean, I'm sorry, and before we plant corn, we'll go into a, a more of a mix. Yes? Like some cover crops are known to um, uptake the phosphorus, and other cover crops are known to uptake more nitrogen. Is yeah. Um, so, no, that's a great question. And uh, I'm not going to be able to give you the best answer for it. I do know that, that crop species will access, will take up different amounts of nutrients, right? Different, different species will, um, based on their rooting patterns and even some of their root um, uh, biology and, and microbiology that goes on along with that, they'll, they'll take up different amounts of nutrients, right? Uh, and there's a lot of interest, a lot of people uh, speculating, looking at different cover crop species and, and how they might take up different amounts of nutrients. I'm not aware of any studies that have really gone into those, those species in great detail. A lot of times they'll go into, uh, there are some, and I, I, I can't tell you right now which ones there are, that have looked at like single species, but um, probably could be more research done there. At least on my part, I need to read more about it. But. Yep. There are definitely some cover crops, like legumes, that will produce more nitrogen because they fix it. Right. Right? Um, and then rooting depth and things like that depend upon how, where they take the nutrients from. Yep. When phosphorus is broadcast, is it liquid or dry? We used dry. So you could use either, but most of the time when they broadcast it on the surface like this, it would be a dry. Um, I suppose pretty heavy dew could, could dissolve it, right? A pretty heavy dew, um, you know. I'm wondering if like a saturated soil in the wintertime over time that would Yeah, so over, uh, definitely if you, if you were to have a really wet saturated soil and even small amounts of precipitation to keep that soil moist, uh, those fertilizer granules will absorb moisture and, and dissolve. Uh, I've got another question for you too. I mean, let me preface it. Around Thanksgiving time, we had over an inch and a half. Right? Yeah, we did, yeah. And then on December 13th, we got another over an inch. And, mm -hmm. half, and you had no runoff? Uh, we had no runoff in December. Wow. But for the, um, <clears throat> for the, and I, I have to go back and look at the data to see exactly how much we got out there. This is south of Manhattan, and it's not too far, but there's a pretty big difference in the amount of rainfall that we get here in Manhattan compared to what we get out at, at our research site. Um, <clears throat> so I can't tell you exactly how much rainfall we had in December, but we didn't have any runoff in December. We did have runoff in, so there are two rainfall events in, in November. One that occurred about a week after we, we had applied our fertilizer, and then the other one a week later in, in Thanksgiving. Uh, the first of those two, we had just a small amount of runoff. The second one, we had quite a bit of runoff, and runoff from all the plots. And that is not part of this data because that's, that's the, year's. yeah, that's next year's. Yep. Yes? And to you, it was primarily phosphorus, which, as you said, was uh, the big concern with phosphorus loss was soil erosion. Uh, 
Uh huh. Are there other nutrients and commonly applied fertilizers where runoff is the biggest issue because they dissolve? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, good question. Um, so phosphorus. When, when I say the the majority of phosphorus lost from agriculture, especially historically with conventional till, has always been with the sediment. Okay. That changes when we start reducing our erosion. So we have really good practices now where we can reduce erosion. And so now when you start looking at no-till systems, you can start getting most of the phosphorus that's lost from the no-till systems as dissolved. Okay? It's a much smaller quantity, but it's very bioavailable. So as soon as that dissolved phosphorus goes into a, into a water body, it can instantly be, be taken up by the, um, by the algae. And so dissolved phosphorus losses are quite critical. Uh, managing dissolved phosphorus losses are quite critical when it comes to managing phosphorus for environmental quality. Uh, as far as other constituents that might be also lost that are dissolved, there are some uh, pesticides or some herbicides that are very soluble. And if they are on the surface of the soil when rainfall occurs, they can get lost. Right? Um, nitri nitrogen is pretty soluble, but the thing is, most of these, uh, most of these uh, constituents that are very soluble or, or chemicals or compounds that are very soluble, if you get a small amount of rainfall, it moves it far enough into the soil where it doesn't get lost too much, right? So if you had a large runoff event right after applying like a nitrogen fertilizer, you could have a whole lot of nitrogen leave your field, but that generally doesn't happen because, uh, because it's, it'll move into the soil you know, before and, and move down far enough to where it doesn't get lost in runoff. Any other questions? Yeah. Not related to your presentation, but I, I, I mentioned earlier that, that you are an alumnus. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I was, in, uh, yeah, I was in the NRES program, my cap, the capstone course. I'll tell you a little bit about the capstone course that I was in. Uh, we had um, actually several advisors that year. I don't know how it was done, but there were, there were several advisors, and the class was brought and broken up into, into you know, five different groups or so and assigned different things. We, we studied uh, Matfield Green Watershed in... Uh, in the center of the Flint Hills, right? And the group that I was in was assigned to look at the agricultural history of Matfield Green Watershed. And uh, Jim Shiro was the advisor. He still teaches here. He was the advisor for that, for that group. And I'll tell you that uh, initially I wasn't really excited about that because I hated history growing up. But it has impacted me considerably since then because I dug into history quite a bit for that project, more than I had in the past, and dug into parts of history that I, that, you know, I hadn't studied in history classes. Things like, you know, if you're looking at changes in agriculture over time in a very small area and how that influences the, um, uh, e even the, uh, uh, you know, multiple aspects of the watershed, you know, number of people living there, the types of farming they're engaged in, the types of crop they're growing, and then that impacts the uh, vegetation and the land cover. It impacts the way the watershed looks, right? Uh, different, different amounts of animals coming in and out. Anyway, it was very interesting. And, and in the end, I became very interested in history and, uh, and how it impacts um, our, our world today. And so that was because of my experience in NRES. And since then, it, uh, it's, it was a great experience to look at, at, uh, um, at environmental issues from multiple aspects. I'll say that. Any other questions for Dr. Young? All right, well, let's thank him for his presentation. Thanks.